Um, and welcome to this 10th webinar in, in our series. My name is Frederick Nyberg. I'm the Managing Director of Medtech Innovator Asia Pacific, based here in Singapore. Uh, Medtech Innovator is a, a nonprofit global competition and accelerator for Medtech Digital Health and IBD. Uh, startups. Um, and according to recent data, in fact, from Silicon Valley Bank, we are uh, the world's largest medical device uh, accelerator. We've been running this uh, for eight years in the US and in Europe, and this is our second year in Asia Pacific. So this series of webinars are part of our accelerator program. And today the topic is social media, public relations and brand management. Uh, and I think we'll tackle those topics, not necessarily in that order. Um, we are, as usual, live streaming this on YouTube. So welcome to our YouTube viewers. Uh, and that's for the first hour of the session. Uh, we have an outstanding panel uh, of experts today uh, that are able to cover these topics from, from multiple angles. Um, and I'm, I'm really thrilled to present um, our, our three panelists. We have Edna Lam, Head of Media Relations and Public Affairs at Johnson & Johnson. She'll tell us a bit more about herself in just a moment. We have Jasmine Chung from um, Align Technology, Head of Corporate Communications there. Uh, both, of course, are MedTech Innovator partners and sponsors, for which we are very grateful. Welcome to both of you. And we also have Marketing Communications uh, veteran and entrepreneur, shall I say, uh, Emma Thompson from uh, Spurwin Communications. She's founder and managing director there. Welcome, Emma. Um, so maybe to begin with, I will ask uh, each of you to just sort of briefly tell us a bit about yourself, your background in marketing <laughs> communications, uh, and, and what it is that you do in your organization. And maybe, uh, Edna, I'll start with you. Okay, thank you, Frederick. And um... Hello, everyone. Good morning. Very happy to see you all. And thanks, uh, MedTech Innovator, for having me here. Um, I joined uh, Johnson & Johnson earlier this year. Um, I have spent my career all the while in in-house communications. Um, before Johnson & Johnson, I spent 40, almost 14 years at the banking sector um, my, with uh, Credit Suisse, the global bank. And uh, I, was running, um, the head of I was running the communications function in Asia um, uh, in my last position. So I'm originally from Hong Kong, but um, I've been in Singapore for 23 years. Uh, I started my communications career in Hong Kong with in the airline sector with Cathay Pacific Airways, dealing with strikes and industrial relations and crises. And uh, it's interesting to be back in the healthcare sector because my first role after I arrived in Singapore 23 years ago was with uh, Parkway Group Healthcare. And I ran the uh, communications team there. Uh, that was a long time ago. So uh, very happy to share some of my insights, some of my experience, but also learn from each other and hear uh, what are the peak points, uh, what are the things that you want to know and how to do, uh, how to go about doing things. So uh, thank you. Great. Thank you, Edna. Uh, Jasmine. Hey, good morning, everyone. I'm Jasmine, really glad to be here. Um, so I lead corporate communications at Align Technology, which is a global medical device company. Um, majority of you probably might not recognize the name, uh, but you might recognize um, the product that we have. And one of them would be Invisalign, which is the clear aligners that um, help straighten your teeth. Um, so I've been with Align for about two years now. Um, I oversee corporate comms, um, which includes internal comms, external comms, PR, um, and then we work with the global team and the marketing teams on branding and mark comms. Um, before this, I was with Cardinal Health, um, also overseeing corporate comms um, for them. And, and at that time, I did a lot of acquisitions. So within three years where I was there, we did two acquisitions and one divestiture. So we did a lot of M&A work, um, focusing mostly on M&A work there. Um, so before that, um, so I've always been in healthcare, I've been in healthcare um, comms for about 15 years now, um, worked both in the US and here, uh, launched um, multiple products, um, both in pharma, medical devices, uh, and mainly because I was in the agency world before I came in-house. And I think that's where I really got um, the majority of my experience in product launches, pre-launched. Um, and I would have to say, since this is MedTech Forum, my, my most favorite, if you guys in the MedTech one knows my, my favorite, and I always have to do a shout out for this, favorite product that I ever launched was the Abbott Viral Resolvable um, Vascular Scaffold. So anyone who's a Abbott 
uh, alumni, you know, that, that was my favorite. I, I did, it. you know, I started working on it on the US um, pre-launch, I think was phase two. When I came back to Singapore, um, you know, uh, I launched it in Southeast Asia. Um, as you know, it's no longer in the market, but it's by far my favorite product. And then I'm super passionate about it. So really glad to be here and, and um, you know, to chat with all of you. Terrific. Thank you, uh, Jasmine. Um, Emma, please. Thanks, Frederick. I'm Emma Thompson. So I founded and I lead Spoen Communications. And we are Singapore's largest healthcare focused agency of communication specialists. I, as you can tell from probably from my accent, I come from England. I spent almost 10 years there in healthcare investor relations and communications working with a very broad range of companies from uh, biotech and medtech's very early stage series A or even sort of seed capital, helping the CEO and the executive teams build their profile, get on the radar of potential partners, acquirers, and of course the important audiences at that stage, the investors that are gonna help bring their product through proof of concept. So 15 years on, I've been in Singapore for eight years and I lead a team of 15 consultants. We work just as I have all my career with companies across the whole healthcare spectrum. So Edna at j, j is a client of ours. We work with some of the consumer healthcare team and we've done some work with the medtech team, but then also we're working with smaller, you know, single device companies. We've worked with Frederick for a couple of years um, during the time, his time at APAC Med. So I, I love the sector, I'm very passionate about it. And within the team, I'm known as the curious narrator. So it's, I bring that mix of learning, but also a passion to make sure that technology as complex as it is can be understood by the audiences that you as companies need to get in front of and be on the radar of. That's nice. great, thanks, thanks Emma. That, I think that's a topic we'll, we'll come back to in, in, in a moment. What I thought I'd, I'd start with maybe before we dive into the details of, of, of brand management and, and, and PR and so on is maybe just get your perspectives on what you currently see as some of the biggest trends in Asia Pacific um, in, in marketing and communications. Um, and and I'll, I'll link that to, to how COVID-19 and the current pandemic has perhaps changed the way companies are now managing their communication strategies. Um, and, and maybe Emma, I'll, I'll, I'll start with you on, on that one. Sure, I, I think they, they do go hand in hand. The trend pre-COVID, you know, sort of the last couple of years, everyone is now their own publisher. So LinkedIn, fantastic platform, medium. You, people have an awareness of the ability to share an opinion via what was probably say for opinion editorials in newspapers. You can now draft your own articles and no one needs to edit them. You get your share of voice and you can put some money behind it. I think COVID is just exacerbating that. If I look at companies that have products to sell, they can't get their sales reps in front of the decision makers to buy them. Physical meetings, especially in the world of medtech, just aren't happening because hospitals are very aware of infection control and they want to limit the numbers of visitors. So we see at the sales rep level, I was just talking yesterday to a client, you know, the team that just trying to break through in any way they can to engage with the HCPs. One team had come up with a game to literally while away some boredom, but it got to, there was some healthcare education, product education happening during the game, but it was sort of a strange concept of almost pin the tail on the donkey version, but it helped enforce, you know, this is the placement of the product, this is how it should be used. So nice quirky ideas. But the key trend is, you know, if you're not on LinkedIn and you're trying, then that's got to be your first port of call. After this call, go and set up a company page and think about what you want to say and when to say it. Thanks. Thanks for that, Emma. Uh, Jasmine, your, your thoughts on the trends you're seeing from Align's perspective and, and, and how COVID-19 has changed things for you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so from our perspective, we've always, when it comes to our customers, our HCPs, it's very much focused on training, right? Making sure that they understand the technology and they know how to use the product from a medical device standpoint. So how do you do that where people can travel anymore? They can't, you know, meet each other. And, and just like the rest of, you know, you know, marketing and, and meetings, just like this one, um, you, know, um, you know, with COVID, everything's moved online. 
And I think, you know, um, in the last few months, we've, we've invested a lot in terms of trying to get as much face time as possible with our doctors and having that online connection with our doctors and it has, you know, um, proven really well. They like the engagement. Um, but going back to your original question around what are some of the trends, the overall trends that we're seeing, even outside our line, I would say, you know, it's really how do you create content um, that you know, speaks to your customer, right? So to Emma's point, you know, be it it's a game or it's a, you know, it's in, in 20 years ago when we talked to HCPs, we showed them, a, we published a paper and we showed them a white paper, right? Um, you know, with or without COVID, you know, people's kind of attention span and the appetite for content has shifted drastically. They want content in video, they want content that is, um, that is shorter. Um, and I'm not saying that the HCPs don't read the white papers or don't read the published papers, they still do. But on a day-to-day, -day, they would kind of consume this sort of micro content. Um, so micro is the buzzword, right? Micro everything, micro content, micro moments. Um, I even went to a micro bakery <laughs> a few days ago. So micro is definitely a new buzzword. So how, you know, the, the broader narrative you create, but where do you create all these different micro moments leading up to other overall arching message that you want to send to your, um, your, your customers and your doctors is probably key. So I, I think, you know, when you think um, about creating that narrative and your kind of media strategy or message strategies, really looking at, you know, um, how you can kind of break those up so that it can really relate to the customers. Yeah, that's a great, great points. And I, I, I like this concept of micro content. I think we'll come back to that as well. Um, Edna, what's been J&J's experience here? I think if I look at it, um, the broader landscape at a high level, um, I think the communicating our products and solutions has always been a very um, established um, um, tradition and uh, uh, with a very good uh, existing practice. I think what probably the industry is moving into is beyond the device uh, with a lot of convergence of technology and products um, that might cut across uh, different disciplines in, uh, in uh, med tech. So, and that brings into also a diversity of audiences. So while traditionally our communication is very much towards uh, end use and customers, HCPs, but you can see in some pockets, the rise of patient um, information, the, the, um, the, the rise of patient rights and the part rise of the patient choice. So the diversity of audiences, I think is one thing. So your communication is probably not just to um, uh, one segment, but you need to take care of your broader corporate reputation. So people look at your overall reputation, how you look at technology, how you look at um, industry partnerships like these, um, or how you develop your talent. So that broader uh, corporate reputation, I think it's increasingly important. And touching on the point that um, the two other speakers have touched on, um, obviously uh, there is also a pivot to away from just purely focusing on uh, very traditional media channels, uh, either the trades or the mainstreams, but towards um, your owned media, uh, your own digital channels. But I think uh, as a communicator, I haven't been in the industry uh, for all these years, you can definitely see that shift, but also the um, requirements and the demands on communicators, because we are very traditionally in this space of dealing with the press, dealing with the media, or dealing with you know, our, our one-way uh, communication channels. But you're in a space where in the digital space, social media, it's completely different skill set, very different metrics. So it's not just publishing one thing in one way. So if you engage in those channels, you need to have that uh, um, specialty and the expertise to actually measure the metrics, whether it's effective, uh, whether you're gaining the traction, whether you're gaining the audience, is it the right audience, uh, and whether your money spent is worth the while. So I think it's moving into that space in terms of communications in general, and certainly for medical devices uh, as well. So, um, and for COVID, uh, obviously, uh, one of the key points that I notice is uh, the heightened uh, attention on healthcare in general, and med tech especially, even beyond just our normal media, but in the mainstream media. So that's why, you know, uh, doing a med tech innovator story in Asia uh, this year obviously has a lot of resonance, uh, has a lot of um, um, relevance. Good, good point. Thanks, thanks for that, um, Edna. 
Um, so, so diving into the topic of branding in a little bit more detail here, and I'll maybe turn to Jasmine here for the, for the, for the first question on this. We have, um, I guess, first of all, uh, talking now to our, our, our cohort of startup CEOs and, and, and founders, um, there is the juggling of the company brand versus the product brand. Um, how does one, should, should companies at this stage start to think about building up a portfolio of brands? How do you, I know with, with Align Technology, obviously you got Align Technology being, being the company, but you have an incredibly strong brand in Invisalign. Uh, as, as I think you pointed out earlier, more people probably know Invisalign than, than Align Technology. How do you juggle that um, company versus product branding? So, you know, I, I think especially for our startup audience, your product is always going to be your first product or your kind of star product is always going to be a baby, right? So that's always going to be that, you know, that brand that you resonate to. But if you think about sort of five years, 10 years, 15 years, what is that runway you're trying to build, right? If you're trying to build a company with multiple products, then, you know, if you're just building the brand of that product itself, then you're doing yourself a disfavor, right? Um, but if you're looking to just sell off that one product, right? If you're trying to make it successful and then uh, get it off the ground, hoping that another medtech device company comes to, to, to buy it, then I, I'll say just bank it on that product. So it really goes back to kind of the purpose and, and, and what you're trying to achieve. Um, having been with, you know, uh, multiple um, kind of medtech companies and also in my previous life in the agency, I, I do see that a lot of companies do have that, um, try to balance between the corporate brand and what the um, product brand is, you know, corporate people like me, you know, we would want to, you know, promote the company, right? And because it's, 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 it's you promote a company um, and, and you also attract talent, you know, it, it, it comes with a whole bunch of stuff, right? Whereas, you know, in marketing, they would just want to push for the product because, you know, um, they're supporting the sales team. Um, so I think if you are a CEO or if you're an MD, um, you know, I, I really say caution, think about what's that purpose. It goes back to the purpose. And I'll give you an example. And, and, and I'm sorry to just throw J and J on the spot here, but in my last, I mentioned earlier that I was doing it. I did two acquisitions and one divestiture. Um, so in fact, Cardinal Health, and most of you might not even know the name Cardinal Health. Um, they, they are better known um, in the pharmaceutical distribution business in the U.S., um, they actually have a revenue of $120 billion. So um, a really large company, um, but from a company brand name, definitely in Asia Pacific, um, not big, right? Um, not well known. And so when I joined them, like hardly anyone in the MedTech um, um, space knew them. And so in my three years there, we actually acquired a business from j, &J. We also acquired a business from Medtronic, right? Two of the largest medical device companies. And the company that we acquired from j, &J was Cordis, and it was a terrific brand, you know, for those in the medtech, you know, Cordis was, you know, the first, uh, one of the first drug eluding stands, you know, great um, kind of great heritage, great brand. Um, but I'll have to say a lot of the employees that we um, sort of um, transitioned over really struggled with because they had, j, j has done such a wonderful job, you know, with your credo and with your brand, right? That, that they, they really, while they, they understood, you know, that Cordes has a rich heritage, they, you know, we brought them along with the Cardinal Health brand, they got it. But, you know, um, I, I can't even tell you half the time where they're like, so what is our credo at Cardinal Health? <laughs> you know, the credo is such a J, J thing. And, you know, we say we have our purpose, we have, you know, this and that, you know, but um, the vision, but I think that the, the employees really struggle. And to me, I think that was brilliant, right? With J, J. It doesn't matter if you're in J, &J medical, it doesn't matter in pharmaceutical, in consumer, everyone knows the credo and they built everything around the credo. And while I've never worked for j, &J um, I've crossed paths, you know, j, j like every employee I know knows about the credo. And I think that in itself from a kind of branded house is, is, is a great way, right? To connect to your employees, your customers, your stakeholders. Um, so that's actually something that I'm looking, you know, for us to kind of um, build here at Align. You know, we build it around our ACA values. So again, you know, we don't have the credo. We actually have a lot of JJ alumni, um, but I always say, no, we're not building another credo. We're, you know, we build around our values. But you know, that's something that really motivates your team. They know 
what you know is the purpose right and what the company stands for so as you build your company as you build your other brands um you know the, the product brands will have their unique identity but i think as a company um you know it's it's, it's really critical to, to 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 build that brand for the company but again if you're looking to sell your product in five years then forget about what i just said I'd also add like, some great points, Jasmine, especially from building an internal and employer of choice brand. But thinking if you're looking for building your profile in front of investors, then the skills of the management team are essentially the brand. You need to build trust in you as a management team, whilst a product might be in prototype or early stage trials. So I think there's definitely a need, say at the series A, series B stage to be thinking, is our brand as a corporate and our management team brand strong enough? Yeah, I think, I think that's, 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 a, that's a great point, Emma. And thanks for, for that Johnson & Johnson plug, Jasmine. That it's, it's a great story about Cordis. And, and maybe I'll ask Edna to comment a bit about the credo. But, uh, but you're absolutely right. Branding is, is very much about trust, isn't it? And, and, and what you have as a startup is not necessarily the clinical evidence yet, not necessarily even a finished product. The trust has to be built around the management team. Um, and how can you brand something uh, just based on the management team? That's, I think that's a, that's a, that's a great, great point. Yeah, Edna, do you want to comment briefly the about the, 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 the credo perhaps and, and the significance of maybe having a vision? Because ultimately that's where, where I guess all marketing communication starts, isn't it? Yeah, so maybe um, I comment probably on like product franchise product brands versus like a corporate brand. So for, for us, um, as you might know, Johnson Johnson is like a 250 portfolio company conglomerate. So that topic is core to a whole communication strategy and the whole communication thinking. And we, you know, discuss this all the time, uh, even after all these years. So while we are that size, but I think some of the things that I observe is uh, even relevant for even small companies, big or small companies, just big or small. So you do have a product and the product is obviously paramount. You have a very targeted audience to your end clients and customers. And I get this quite sometimes as why do we need to communicate about Johnson & Johnson and medical devices? It's about our franchise. It's about this very important orthopedic franchise or that surgical franchise or the cardiovascular franchise. But um, what I obviously observe in the last few years is a lot of reputation. It's not about the product. A lot of reputation, the issue might be from the product, but reputation is about the company in general, who you are, who was the face that fronted? How do you respond to reputation matters? It's not about the product anymore. When you're mentioned in the press, it's about Johnson & Johnson. Uh, it's not specifically about potentially just the franchise or the product. So that is why building your corporate reputation is absolutely critical because at some point you will talk to more than just an end consumer, an end client base. You will have to deal with regulators or, you know, uh, governments or industry or your business partners who might look at you beyond just your device. So I think corporate reputation is absolutely critical. And if we do a partnership like with MedTech Innovator, it's not about the product. It's about Johnson & Johnson as a corporation. Why do we value innovation? Why do we value collaboration with the industry? Uh, why is this important for us in our innovation journey? Why is it that we support innovation ecosystem? Why do we support startups? So that reputation is beyond the device. It's about the company, who you are, how you, what your values are, and how do you go about you know, living those values? And so obviously that ties back to Credo because ultimately what all these partnerships do is to actually hopefully improve patients' lives and you know deliver better outcomes so all this deliver to that you know value-based credo and so that's why i think not just the product but your corporate reputation thanks thanks Edna. good good great points there um let's talk a little bit about the differences in communicating to physicians or i guess in, in, in alliance case dentists or and and um dental surgeons and consumers or patients. Um, and, and maybe Jasmine, I'll turn to you because you have that challenge, I guess, every day. You have to communicate directly to patients and to consumers um, and you have to communicate directly to, to the professional healthcare uh, pro provider. 
what are some of those differences and con contrasts and, and, and what are some of the regulations you have to adhere to, to um, uh, in, in, in your comms strategy to each of those segments? Yeah, absolutely. So first and foremost, um, for those who don't know, um, so Invisalign, it's a it's clear aligners that replaces kind of braces, right, to help straighten the teeth. Um, so our business model is very clear. We do not sell our clear aligners to um, consumer our patients, right? Um, we, we work with our doctors to it. So our direct customers are um, are, are really orthodontists and GPs. We, 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 we sell to them, we train them on the technology. And it's not just about that piece of plastic. It's, it's really an end-to-end -end digital platform where the doctors um, actually use um, digital kind of um, um, platforms to, 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 to do the treatment from scanning all the way to doing the treatment plan. So that is our business model, right? We do not sell to consumers. That said, you know, um, we do invest, and last year I believe we invested $100 million in terms of um, patient education um, and also promoting the brand and, 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 you know, for a couple of reasons, right? You know, we want to do that to make sure that, you know, patients, um, obviously we want to promote the brand, but also it's very important uh, for patients to know, um, you know, how to do it safely, that they need to go through a doctor to do it, you know, um, and, and, you know, what are things that they have to kind of watch out for. So a lot of it is it's advertising, but it's also um, education. And, um, you know, back to your question, Frederick, um, why is that important, right? Um, because we are in this age now where, you know, be it dental or not, where you go into um, the, the doctor's office, um, a lot of, um, you know, patients now are so much more well, well informed, right? Thanks to the world wide web, the great world wide web. And also people are just generally more empowered and, and they want to go and find out more about their health, right? So, you know, before you see a doctor, it's not uncommon that, you know, you will go Google and you think that you have five different, you know, illnesses and you kind of question the doctor about it. Um, but, but because patients are more well-informed, it's really important that you get the right kind of information to them and you educate them, um, right? And, 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 and to help them make the right decision together with their uh, physicians. So, um, you know, we actually hear stories, um, at least for, for in the dental world, we hear stories and um, so our clinical director, um, um, who was actually a practicing orthodontist in France, he loves Invisalign uh, and, and that's why he joined our company and he, he, he's now a clinical director in Singapore, but when he was a practicing orthodontist in France, you know, he spent many years, you know, being trained as an orthodontist, he he, um, you know, had to, um, you know, orthodontist, you know, uses their hands, to, you know, to get into the mock, to, to, to do all the wires and bracket. And it was, he, he, he won nothing got to do with Invisalign when he was first introduced to it. But it was his patients who actually convinced to him. So he shared this story many times. The patients one by one were coming to him and saying, hey, we heard about this new product. You know, we want to try it. And, and you know, if he said no, he'll be turning away kind of, patients or customers, right? So eventually he, he tried it and then he thought that, you know, it was, it was a, he's like, why didn't I, you know, do this before he got trained with it? But I, I think back to the point of, you know, why is it important for, you know, medical device companies to educate the, um, their, their uh, end consumers or patients? That's precisely why. Um, patients have choices. Patients are more educated. They want to know what goes behind the signs. Um, back to Edner's, you know, um, point, they... They, they see the reputation of a company um, um, as, as one of the um, deciding factors. So for example, do I, if there's two products, you know, um, one by J&J &J that I've heard of, one by XYZ that I've not heard of, you know, I'll go look at this company itself, not just a product. Um, and you know that with the millennials, you know, with this whole generation, you know, how the company operates is also something that they care about, right? So I, I think at the end of the day, you know, um, it, it's, it's just, you know, with more of an educated, patients um, and, and we need to make sure that we get the right information out there right so that you know the patients can be um, making the right choices yeah that's, that's that's a great point and Emma I guess you've been working with with both consumer oriented clients and and um, and, and of course directly with with clinicians and, and healthcare providers what, what are some of the challenges there in in terms of um, developing communication strategies to those segments so the, on the HCPs, I'd say, and I'm sure everyone understands and appreciates this, it's the fact that they're time poor, you know, trying to get their attention to sell a product to them, you are secondary, they, you're a cost to their time rather than, you know, something that they'll generate revenue. You need to have 
quite an open-minded position to get you know, bring a new innovation like the orthodontist story that you just said, Jasmine, about your clinical director. Yeah, you know, he he takes persuading to open the door and to change, to innovate. A lot of HCPs have been trained in one way at medical school. And you, know, you really have to come with robust evidence as to your product being tried and tested. And it especially is true in looking at a market like Singapore, where it, you know, there's a huge percentage of private practitioners. They don't, you know, their risk and their reputation is their brand. Their name is their brand. They can't afford to take risk on something that's unproven. But, you know, as we also, you know, Dr. Google is also creating a demand from the patient to come into the doctor and say, well, you know, have you looked at this new approach? I read on forums. Why aren't you doing it? Who will do it in, you know, in my market, for example? So um, in terms of the consumer, I would just completely agree with Jasmine. They are far more informed than they were five years ago, 10 or 20 years ago. The, I think the old approach of, you know, we went to our doctor, they gave us an opinion or a diagnosis and we believed them and that was it. They gave us a treatment plan and we followed it. That is changing rapidly. I spoke this morning just to someone who's invested in you know, a second opinion, free online, access to very high quality doctors um, you know, who will give you a free opinion and a second opinion and let you inform you to challenge the first doctor or the second doctor that you've seen. You know, knowledge is power and patients are coming armed with it to the physician's office. Interesting, interesting point. And uh, just a reminder to our cohort companies, you are welcome to uh, ask questions that we'll get to in the uh, in the final 30 minutes. Just enter them into the, um, use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and we'll, we'll get to those. Um, one question that I, I get from time to time from, from startup companies um, is they're so keen to brand, especially if they have a if they have a system with multiple components where they may have an artificial intelligence algorithm, they may have a disposable device, they may have a piece of capital equipment and, 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 and maybe aim to sell this on sort of a razor, razor blade model. And they want to give everything a brand and a different brand. What are some of your, your thoughts on, on, on that? Would you suggest it makes more sense to work on a single brand for that entire um, system as, a, as an innovation or, or does it ever make sense to make to, to, to brand components uh, component parts in a larger system um, and um, I don't know if anyone's had any experience of doing something like this um, Jasmine maybe in your work with with uh, with with Cardinal with Abbott is this something you've come across um, I can't think of a specific example right now to share, uh, but I would say in general, if you think, you know, we're, we're talking about med tech, but if you think about everything else, like we are all consumers in our own right, right? So if you think about, I'm just throwing out like a shaver that you're buying or, or something, you know, that you're buying, you know, you wouldn't brand every single different part, you know, you want to associate everything into one brand as much as possible so that you can resonate with your customers or the consumers. And I think it's the same principle, right? It is something that's extremely unique. Um, um, then obviously you want to give it a, a, a special name. But if you think about, I'm going to say Apple, because I have all my Apple devices literally sitting in front of me right now. I have the iPad, I have my, my earphones, my watch, and two iPhones. Um, but, you know, um, the, the iPhone, the iWatch, all these are just names to describe the product. But then the brand itself are all just Apple, right? It's not, you know, an orange watch, an Apple iPad. So, um, sorry, this is just the example that have come to mind because it's right in front of me. But I think, you know, it, it's, it's the same principle. And also think about when you go to your regulators, right? We come back to the medical sp um, device space. Um, if you have built, you know, credibility with the iPhone and then you go to the regulators and you're going to get, just imagine the iPhone is a, is a medical product, okay? And then you're going to the regulators and you're going to get an extended, you know, um, approval for, for, for something that's tacked on to this product. Um, and you've already built a great reputation and, and, and a lot of um, good um, kind of clinical outcomes from that, you want to build on that. You don't want to start from scratch to get the regulators to think that is a completely different device. 
So I, I think, you know, uh, just based on that, obviously every situation is different, but on a very high level, I would say my recommendation is to kind of make sure that, you know, you can kind of leverage on what you have built previously. Yeah, that's, it's a good I point about looking at, sorry, go ahead, uh, Emma. I have one example where I've worked with a company that developed its own point of care device. Right. And it was exactly the razor, razor blade model. So, but we, brand, you know, they branded the device, the actual system that sat on the doctor's desk. And then all of the assays that ran through it were, you know, the Affinian lipid panel or the Affinian CRP. So to the Justin's point about the regulators, yes, there was sort of brand familiarity, but that company was acquired first by Alir and then eventually by Abbott, who had been a partner way back when anyway. You know, both those companies, Alir and Abbott, just took that device in and gave it like an AL1000 mm. brand. You know, Affinion was gone. It's, if you Google Affinion, it's very hard to find it anymore. Um, but then they thought, but you know, we use it as, when we would report to investors, it's how many opinions have been placed or sold, but they just want to know about cartridge utilization. So I think there's, if we go down the very sort of you know, consumer HCP route, then yes, a brand is important, but when you're thinking about reporting to your board and investors, they just want to know how much is that brand bringing in in terms of usage. And that then just sits with, is there trust in the brand that we can just place opinions really quickly, or is every sale taking you know two or three months to convince the physician to take it? Yeah, that's it's a good point, and it's a <clears throat> it's a balance balance, I guess, between that approach and 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 looking at what regulators are after, because they, I guess the, the the benefit of going along what, what Jasmine was just saying is if if the regulator if you are looking to regulate your product as a system uh, as an integrated whole then it probably makes sense to push that as the single brand um you're likely to confuse the regulators and get more questions than you'd maybe want to tackle if you start to um use a set of multiple brands for, for various parts and components in that in that sale. Um, great point. This, of course, is all linked to, to trademarks and, and registered uh, trademarks. And maybe I'll turn to Edna on this. What, how important are registered trademarks? And is this something that should be a, a priority for, for startup companies? Um, so, Frederick, I, I don't think I'm in the right position to comment uh, on this particular uh, point. <laughs> apologies, maybe I'll turn to, 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 to Jasmine Jasmine then on, on trademarks. Um, well, I'm not going to pretend I'm an expert on this. My lawyers, my IP lawyers will probably be an expert in this. But I Of course. Just at a, very at, high, at a high level, level perhaps. Yeah. Link to your brand, you know, definitely, you know, especially in this very innovative space. Um, and, you know, if, if you're first to market, especially if you're first to market, right, and if it's an innovative product, you probably want to look into investing into IP protection, um, and that will serve you well down the road. Um, but I, I, I think, you know, if it's a very, very crowded market, then, you know, I don't know, it's really up for grabs. So I would say I look at it from a brand perspective, but from a legal perspective, there's probably other kind of impact to it. And and I, I also recognize that, you know, as a startup, you know, maybe investing on this might not um, be top of mind from a cost perspective. But again, you know, if, if it's a very unique product and also if it's a unique name that you really want to maintain from a brand perspective, um, it's something worth looking into. Um, but I, I, I also want to caveat that it's different in each market, right? So it depends on which markets you're going to having it trademark and the U.S. Uh, or in EMEA doesn't necessarily mean, you know, it's trademark in, for example, Singapore and China and, and the rules and, and, and are, are very different. So if you are based out of, you know, Singapore um, as a startup, but your main market is going to be China. Um, again, I'm not going to pretend I'm an expert in the China market, but I know for a fact that it's very, very different in terms of the IP rules. Then, you know, um, I wouldn't even bother trying to trademark it here in Singapore. But again, I think a lawyer would be best, you know, to yeah. answer that. Yeah, no, that's 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 a that's a fair point. Let's um, let's talk a little bit more about public relations then. Um, and uh, you're all professionals in in this arena, and um, our audience are are primarily founders and, and chief executive officers of of small businesses. Um, what do we mean by public relations? What does that 
what does that what counts as PR? Does does it uh, um, if if you get mentioned in a peer reviewed medical journal, is that public and, and and work towards getting your name in there? Is that is that PR? Uh, working at professional and, and and medical conferences, thought leadership pieces, are all of that part of PR, or is it is it mostly? And does it perhaps too often get confused with with um, media relations and, and, and media strategy? And, and maybe I'll turn to Emma first for your, your perspectives on this. Absolutely. Thank you, Frederick. I mean, I would like to think about things as external relations. That's the clearest bit. It's internal communications, external communications. And if you look at it under that broad umbrella, then everything you've mentioned falls under external relations. So that peer reviewed journal could get picked up. You know, you have no control over who's viewing it online. So you want it to be positioning you in a favorable light. If you're speaking at a Congress or if you're speaking on a webinar, no matter what the platform is, your message should be consistent. People should know, oh, that's company X and they're doing X, Y, and Z. Um, media relations is one element of public relations. It's getting harder and harder to gain traction with media relations, you have to have a really strong hook. Right now in healthcare, unless you're doing something with COVID-19, you, know, you can put yourself down to the bottom. And if it's an early stage product, people, journalists just see through hype now. You could say this product could address the world's biggest crisis if we pretend this is a time pre-COVID-19 then they're still going to say, well, when is the product going to be available? So, like, a newspaper, you have to remember, is read by your mum and dad on a Saturday morning. If they read about a product, they'll call their doctor and say, I want that product. And so there's no point over-promising and creating hype and a buzz around a product, excuse me, that could still be eight years away from market. So media relations is important, but know your audience and know what you're trying to achieve as a company. If you're trying to get raise money, then you should be thinking about building relations with the trade media or the investment media, getting into the business pages of a newspaper, not the front of the paper. Um, so media relations is one. Thought leadership LinkedIn is also external relations. Speaking events, peer review journals, as I've said, it, it all comes under external relations. And you should, you know, a great plan should look at all of those streams together. You should be mapping out a 12 month plan at least and thinking, right, well, I'm speaking here. What am I doing? What am I writing about on LinkedIn at, this, at a similar time? Does it come together? If someone saw me speak and then they read my follow up piece, are they seeing a cohesive story? Thanks. Thanks for that, Emma. Great, great point. Um, uh, Edna, from, from J&J's perspective, um, what well, maybe just to build on, on, on Emma's point, what, what do you see as being um, a, a newsworthy story to pitch to, to media these days? Uh, do you agree that it really has to be COVID related or it's not going to get anyone's attention? And, and, and this balance between, between um, uh, the morning papers and, and highly specialized trade media, which of those channels make the most sense for, for a startup to, to get into and why? Um, and, um, and, and maybe what are some of Johnson & Johnson's um, experiences in terms of engaging with mainstream media before a product launch? Um, does that, how, how much ahead of a launch date does that typically happen? Uh, because to Emma's point, if uh, your mom and dad read about this on a Saturday morning, and it can't be bought um, or you can't have your physician prescribe this for another six, 12 months, then obviously there's, there's a challenge there. Um, what are your thoughts, Emma? Edna? Um, so I, I think in terms of the media, mainstream media, we're talking about mainstream media, you know, business, dailies and all that. It is enormously hard to get in, not just for startups, but in general, even for a company of our size, because we operate in a rather niche space and not all mainstream press cover a niche space as medtech or even healthcare in general. Uh, if they do cover healthcare, it's very, if you look at, for example, Singapore or even some of the other markets, it's very policy, uh, it's very public policy. It's how it affects the cost of the end consumer, the end patient, 
um, it, it's about institutions, for example, the healthcare institutions. MedTech is a very niche space. So I personally don't think that, you know, mainstream press should be your first port of call. I think this is setting up for a 50% chance of uh, failure. Um, when we do, even in Johnson & Johnson Medical Device, when we do product communication, it's very much towards obviously a trade press because obviously in each market, there are very stringent uh, regulations around you know, product marketing. And obviously communications or doing a press exposure is part and parcel of that. So you have to be very careful in navigating the regulatory environments of every single market that you're in, what's allowed and what's not allowed in terms of product marketing slash communication to a direct mass audience. So we do do a lot of trade uh, trade media when it comes to you know new product initiatives, um, uh, things like that. So obviously that space is in very limited because newsrooms only downsize these days. People's reading habits have moved on to digital channels. Traditional media has been obviously a kind of like a shrinking area. So your own digital channels has to be an extremely important part of your communication while obviously observing all the regulatory, uh, for example, in some markets in our region, I understand that they cannot use social media at all in communicating you know, about medical devices um, in general uh, because of their interpretation of the regulatory environment uh, in certain parts of, for example, North Asia. So um, engaging your own digital channels, I think it's obviously a, a very important piece of that. Um, and uh, as Emma rightly pointed out, that whole external relations piece, it's all like the, the various touch points, you know, your exposure at events, for example, if you had a presentation at uh, the APACnet forum last week, uh, as part of the, you know, MedTech Innovator Asia Pacific program, how do you leverage that touch point, that very, very valuable, important exposure, and how do you uh, amplify that to your target audiences? What do you do on your own social media channels with that very important event? So um, things like that, uh, I think it's extremely important. Mainstream media is obviously critical and Frederick, you know that we have some interesting um, wins in some of the traditional media space. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. You know, CNBC and Business Times and all that. And that's primarily because I think a few things. Number one, it's uh, it's COVID. So as I said, a very heightened sense of importance of healthcare and also med tech. Um, secondly, I think med tech innovator is a very interesting platform because uh, very timely, we know from Silicon Valley Bank is the largest med tech uh, accelerator in the world. So journalists love those kind of proof points. <laughs> and thirdly, it's about Asia. It's about entrepreneurship. It's about Asian innovation. And these are things that, you know, the broader audience, the media audience, they love that, especially in this part of the world. Um, it's a very feel good factor. Medical uh, device, med tech is very important. You know, bring people together, building the ecosystem. These are important points. And bear in mind that um, very importantly is proof points. So when you do your message architecture, the first thing you should start with is a message architecture, who you are, what you do, what are your value propositions, and what is the value you bring that differentiates. So all of these proof points, and journalists love media, love quantifiable proof points, is critical. And going forward, when you have real world evidence, when you have clinical studies that are within regulatory uh, permissible bounds, that can be communicated, those are very important. So bear in mind, proof points, build your message architecture, uh, reinforce them with proof points and going forward. It's a long journey and brands are not built in one day, it's uh, over the years. Some excellent points there, um, Ed, and I really appreciate it. And, and uh, just as a reminder to, to our cohort companies, for all, all of you were there, you all pitched your five minutes last week at the, um, at the APAC MAD um, virtual forum. Do leverage that on social media, even if it's now a week from uh, after the event, there are still ways that you can, you can do that. Quick question for Emma. Um, many of these uh, smaller companies typically do not have a dedicated marketing communications person in-house. Um, at what point in, in a company's development does it make sense for, for them to start to work with an external professional, 
advisory firm on this. And I know you, you may give, give us a slightly biased answer, but uh, I value your opinion. I try not to be biased, but so to give it, I, I look at it from both sides, from our side as an agency and the investment we have to put in to get to know a company, but also we are very realistic when we start working with smaller companies about this, what that investment means in terms of you know, the budget they have and how far they need it to go. I think the best way to work is to have a chemistry test with a few agencies, get to know the team that would be representing you. Do they understand your asset? Do they understand what you're trying to achieve, who you're trying to attract? Like, what is the end game as we've been talking about? Are you going to, do you have ambitions to take this product to market yourself? Or is it more of a strategic, we need to talk about this product publicly, but it's the ear of the acquirer that we want. I would say start, you know, start announcing your milestones. Be proud of the fact that, for example, you've got your first round of investment in, or you've made your first filing, you've started your first clinical study. Share that. Let people know that there's progress. Uh, often, you know, small companies are often very, you know, tightly privately held. People will hear about you in a burst, and then they go quiet again. And so people, st when there's silence, people have just assume the worst. Oh, timelines have slipped, the data hasn't been good. Yes, there is value in holding data back for, you know, ahead of a key Congress or, you know, the, the, what was the moment of the year, the JP Morgan conference. You want to go with news when you're seeing people again. But if I was going to run a small med tech company, I would get to know a, P, a couple of PR agencies. I'd work out which ones I really gel with. And I'd say, right, can we work on some small projects? We would map out our news flow. It's lumpy and it's, you know, there is going to be sometimes where there's gaps of nine months but let them you know get to know each other and then you start ramping up and look to a retained process and contract when you're you know I don't know for sale about to launch when you really need a team that is on hand and that's when you get the best value for money as well you know you've got them retained they're thinking of you all the time the agency a good agency will come to you with ad hoc ideas as well as being able to look at what you've got coming up and saying this is a news moment. This is where you should be positioned. So yep. start small, early stage. Don't underestimate the value of your progress points, but don't commit yourself to a retainer because the agency will struggle as well. You'll fall into a fight of the agency doesn't feel like it's performing. You haven't got news flow to share, etc. Hmm. A good agency will work with you project by project and then look, you know, the relationship is with the CEO at this stage. So they want to follow the CEO through the company. Good, good, good feedback. Um, and and Jasmine, you you do a lot of regional work, of course, uh, with 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 a line. On the public relations front, what what are some of the major regional differences that you see working in 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 markets like Australia and Japan and China and Southeast Asia and and, and so on? And what are some of the things that that a company needs to be a, a, aware of before embarking on a on a major public relations campaign that that's going to go across the region? Yeah, so we all know that this region is very diverse, right? So I worked in the U.S. for eight years before I moved back to Singapore um, to do um, regional roles. And, you know, in the U.S., as big as the U.S. is, it's one market, right? Whereas in APEC, you know, um, it's, you know, 13, 14, 17 markets, depending how you slice and dice. And so it's so diverse, but there are similarities, actually. So let me talk about similarities first. So firstly, like what Edna say, you know, um, the, the media newsroom is, is shrinking. You know, they have less attention. So from a media relations standpoint, it, it is very challenging, right, to go out and, and, and it's no longer the days where, you know, um, you have a editor and all he does is do editing and you have one healthcare person. Um, in some markets in, in APEC, they, we, they never went through that cycle, but um, in, in some markets previously, they only do healthcare or they might only cover the beat of medical device, right? Like maybe in Japan, there are some, you know, um, um, trade press that does that. So you have their full attention. They know everything you go in. Um, you don't have to educate them from the start. Um, now, you know, in the last five years, you know, because the media rooms are shrinked, um, they have to cover so many different beats. Um, even if you have a, um, say when I launched the Abbott vascular kind of scaffold, that, that is very, very um, kind of technical, but you have journalists who are coming who was covering you know, pet food the day before. So, you know, it, they don't have the full knowledge of the industry. 
they don't know what does you know um, coronary disease entail, right? They, they, they know nothing. So there's a lot of education that needs to be done. So I think that's similar across markets, right? Um, um, in, in APAC and compared to you know um, US and EMEA, we, we really don't see as much kind of regional trade, so to speak. Um, we see a lot of that in EMEA, right? And and, and I, I've never worked in an EMEA market, so Emma can comment on that. But there are in different industry, even as you know, on Europe, they, they might have certain traits that they can go to, but not so much um, in, in APAC. So I think that's similar um, in the region. Um, another thing that I found um, similar in the region is that I think when Edna mentioned earlier, how do you get the attention of the press? And um, I think what I've seen across markets here is that um, when you partner with a government entity, um, definitely you will get some uh, attention from the press, right? So if you are based in Singapore, if you're working with EDB, you know, explore how you can, you know, uh, um, um, leverage that, right? In terms of, you know, if you have a small, even if it's a small partnership, you know, explore EDB, can we do an announcement around that? That always helps, right? So um, across markets in Japan and China, in some markets they're getting a little bit more stringent as in the, the regulators um, don't want to be seen as promoting a product so that there's always that sensitivity. Um, but if there's a partnership, so for example, Apple partner with the health promotion board, right? In their global announcement to, to you know, um, um, incentivize and, and track the, you know, that is a great partnership for them to announce. So um, if you have any sort of like partnership or, or, or um, that you're working with local governments, I think that's always a good thing. That good good thing to them. announce. Good yeah. thing to announce. Yeah, great. Really. Thanks. I'm, I'm conscious of conscious of time and I did want to touch on social media as well. Um, so, so maybe we're obviously we, we've spoken at, at length about already about um, creating digital content and, 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 and leverage, leveraging digital channels. So let's be a little bit more specific here. Um, I think most of um, startup companies, in whether they're in medtech, digital health, have a LinkedIn platform. And if they don't, they have, that should be, I guess, their number one priority. But other than LinkedIn, where else should a, a medtech startup be? Be, be present in, 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 in the social media spheres, uh, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, um, should they have Instagram accounts? Uh, what, what are some of your, your thoughts on this? Uh, maybe Emma, I'll, I'll get your thoughts on this first. I'm a big believer, I think that this audience that it focus on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, they, they take a lot of time and you probably don't have an in-house comms person generating content to keep these platforms fresh. Think about your audience. Where do they communicate? Physicians do tend to communicate in Facebook groups. You know, they have their own private groups. Um, if you have a way of infiltrating those, then great. But I would be very realistic. Don't overcommit. The worst thing you can see is going onto like a, a Facebook page or something that hasn't been updated in nine months. You just think the company's gone dormant. I would put some energy behind LinkedIn, thinking of the senior level of management team running these companies and try and make sure that you're sharing content that doesn't hype your product, don't overpromise, under underdeliver, but use the platform to point to milestones to stay on the radar of partners, regulators, et cetera. Great, great point. Edna, uh, your, your thoughts on this. And, and, and for a company that's perhaps looking to China, should they be on WeChat? Maybe and what else? Maybe what two are the, points some of the challenges with that? Maybe two points about social media is um, um, number one is um, if you think that you whatever you post reaches all your ten thousand or twenty thousand or thirty thousand followers, it's completely obviously wrong <laughs> because all these platforms are so algorithmized that actually anything you post reaches only maybe two to three percent, and that's like a standard on LinkedIn or Facebook or whatever. So number one is think about. Uh, building followership, obviously, but number two is uh, smartly using paid uh, posts because that's really the trend to go. Because you can then target HCPs, target markets, target specific professions, target specific areas of interest, and that helps you narrow down. Obviously, they might not still be your end audience, but that's better than just posting something in general and hoping that someone will see it. And number two is, according to our research, um, and probably that's more of a US-based uh, research, it's uh, the most prevalent uh, channels for HCP, reaching HCPs are really um, LinkedIn and Twitter. 
LinkedIn, obviously. Twitter is obviously for more, uh, for more very timely, very now, very short kind of post, short kind of content. Facebook in our research is more for patients. So we do a lot of, for example, patient disease management education, public education uh, in partnership with uh, key opinion leaders or institutions uh, using Facebook because it's more consumer facing. Um, Instagram is obviously very consumer facing, very short, uh, very photographic. So you've got to understand the dynamics of each channel and what is relevant for you, as Emma said rightly, um, you don't have a lot of resources. So you need to make sure that you maximize the reach, maximize the return, maximize the impact out of that limited resources that you have. And always um, plan, as Emma also <laughs> rightly pointed out, plan your communications, right? So not stop gap, make sure that everything you post follows certain uh, key values, key themes uh, about your company, about your product, about your investment uh, fundraising timeline. So uh, things like that are very important. China, it's absolute WeChat, you know, social media language is absolutely heterogeneous in Asia. It's not English uh, speaking in general. You have so many diverse languages and, and in some markets, they have very diverse, uh, they have very different social media usage as well. For example, in Japan, it's really about Line. Uh, in China, it's WeChat, and they're all completely local language specific. So you have to have the amount of resources, you have to have the determination to crack these markets if you want to play in this space and know how to do it with um, the right professional help, because you can't do it alone. Yeah, great, great points. And I think on that note, uh, we time is up. Um, I will just ask uh, each of our panelists maybe for a, a few closing words. And and um, Edna, you made some, some great points here just now, but maybe two questions uh, for each of our panelists. And I'll, I'll, I'll start with Jasmine. Uh, any final tips or advice that you'd want to give to um, the startups that are on, on this webinar? Um, and if uh, any of them have any follow-up questions, can they reach you? And if so, how? Jasmine. So Frederick, well, I'll answer the second one first. Absolutely. So you can definitely reach me. I think, you know, Frederick and team will probably share my contact details. You can also find me on LinkedIn. So here are the power of LinkedIn again. Happy to connect and, and share um, and learn together as well, right? Um, back to your first question, I think back to the tip, um, I echo what Emma said earlier in terms of engaging um, kind of more comms early on, um, you know, be it an agency or to bring in someone. I know, you know, especially as a startup, you always, you hire the first trinity first, right? The CEO, um, finance person, HR. Um, I can tell you that, you know, um, recently I was talking to a fintech, a friend who's in fintech and his second high role was actually Marcoms after finance. And he's saying, you know, reason really simple, right? You want to build that story early on and, not just wait till you're ready to launch. So I think, you know, that's something to kind of reconsider um, in terms of how you build your teams. Very good. Thank you for that. Uh, Emma. Absolutely. You can reach me on LinkedIn. Um, so my profile is just Emma Thompson from Swearing Communications. Great. A couple of takeaways. I would say be just be consistent. I don't know if any of you caught the Trump-Biden debate just before this session. But I can tell you the one message that Mr. Trump is giving out is that Joe Biden has spent 47 years in politics and has apparently achieved nothing. He said that, I watched it for about half an hour, and that line came out about, I think, 13 times. So true example, I don't know that he's the best communicator to be holding up, but he's definitely consistent. Build trust from the start. Don't hype and don't over-deliver. Uh, don't um, don't over-promise, but absolutely over-deliver. So don't feel that you have to create a buzz right here and right now. Give people, you know, people are buying into your story at the stage that you're at now. Give them, bring them on the journey with you. Let them know, right, this is the next milestone. We'll report back then. Don't feel you just have to speak to fill a gap. Um, and just know your audiences. Really think about, like, what, who are you trying to get in front of? Because coming back to that point, you can say you want a Bloomberg piece or you must be on CNBC. But is that really reaching the people that you need to, to actually progress your business? I think, you know, the trade media at this stage of life is overlooked, but should be a key priority. Great advice, Emma. Thanks for that. Uh, Edna. Yes, so absolutely can reach me via LinkedIn. Um, my last uh, words will be, it's all about the message, the message, the message. 
So what is your message architecture? You have to plan this beforehand and create that uh, infrastructure so that you can define your audience, your channels accordingly, uh, who you want to reach, what channels do you want to deploy? How do you go about doing that? Is it you know, earned or is it paid? How much resources do you put behind that? And consistency is very important, Emma. So stick to that. Don't go shoot left, right, and center and do all sorts of things that are not core to your message and waste the time and resources. So map that journey, mark the key milestones, whether it's a product development, whether it's your approvals, whether it's a fundraising. Um, and most important of all, is also uh, create faces for the company. Your CEOs, your key people, they represent the company. So they are the face of the company. And for startups, I think that's very important. People want to listen to that entrepreneur journey. People want to know why you're doing this. What is the mission? So I think those are very important as one well. and making sure that the faces of your company deliver those messages um, impactfully. Great, great advice, great insights. Thank you all so very much. Uh, we, this marks the end of our panel. Uh, discussion on YouTube. Don't hang up, uh, ladies, stay online for our Q&A, but uh, we'll part ways with our YouTube viewers at this point. Uh, thank you and join us next week at uh, the same time.